and Stacy, please go ahead. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. I know you guys must be really busy during the December of the semester. I know I'm pretty busy too. So I really appreciate you coming. And Dean is right. We've had an amazing semester of speakers, really famous, well-known artists who, you know, who have taken their precious time to speak with us. So it really is an honor and a privilege that also tonight we have an amazing, amazing artist. So I'm really <laughs> glad you're here and please, you know, feel free to ask questions toward the end. And especially because Professor Bustamante, she teaches at USC, they have an MFA program. She attended SFAI, which also a lot of our students attend for an MFA. So please like really use this opportunity to speak with her and ask questions. So I'd like to introduce our wonderful speaker who I'm so grateful came tonight. Now Bustamante is a legendary artist residing in Los Angeles. Bustamante's precarious work encompasses performance art, video installation, filmmaking, sculpture, and writing. Bustamante has presented in galleries, museums, universities, and underground sites all around the world, including the institution, no, sorry, the institution, the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, the New York Museum of Modern Art, and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Her awards and residencies include Anonymous Was a Woman Fellowship, the New York Foundation for the Arts Fellow, Artist in Residence at UC Riverside, and UC Mexis Scholar in Residence. In 2020, Bustamante's forthcoming VR film, The Wooden People, received a producing grant from the Mike Kelly Foundation and the National Performance Network and will be presented at Red Cat in 2021. 2021 has also brought her success with her new research project, Bloom, in which she is determined to redesign the speculum and take a stern look at the history of pelvic examination. Bloom has been supported by COLA, the City of Los Angeles Fellowship, an Art Pace Residency, and a USC Arts and Humanities Award. Bustamante is an alum of San Francisco Art Institute, and in 2020, they awarded her an honorary doctorate. Currently, she holds the position of Professor of Art at the USC Roski School of Art and Design. So without further ado, please welcome our esteemed guest, Nao Bustamante. I sound amazing. You are. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Stacy. Uh, thank you, Dean, uh, for the invitation. I really 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 appreciate it and i'm really touched um just to be back in the valley talking to y'all um i want to introduce my dog gita she says hello everybody and she sends you light and love as you are rounding out your semester because i know how that is uh, it's been a really tiring couple of years, I guess. <laughs> um, thank you for the comments on the cute doggy Gita. Yeah, she's very sweet. Um, yeah, so if y'all, uh, as we go through, I'm going to just do a kind of slideshow, talk about my work. And um, if you want to pop questions in the chat as we go so you don't forget them, that's cool. I'm going to be sort of monitoring so I can uh, maybe address some of them as I go. But I know that um, people want to have a little bit more of a robust conversation at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and begin to share screen. And my hope, uh, I don't know how you all do it, but my hope is that um, at the end, of the screen sharing that you all will come back and that I'll be able to see your, uh, you know, or at least have some kind of, um, you know, just so I'm not talking out into the void kind of experience that is so common um, with these Zoom experiences. All right, I'm going to begin to share screen. <sighs> Where is my slideshow? Where is my slideshow? Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to start with a sticky video. I don't know if you can see it. Is it 
is it uh, stuttering a lot? Or is it kind of okay? That's good. What a ridiculous person. Um, okay, so that is a, oops, that was a really terrible frame to stop on. You look like a zombie. Okay, so that's from a, a work called Neapolitan. And uh, basically with this, well, let me back up a little just to say that a lot in my process, well, okay, I'm going to back up even further because I think that some of you probably aren't familiar with my work. And um, I came out of sort of a dance framework and moved into performance and then um, started developing video works and then started developing video installation works and then began doing more research-based projects. And I think one way you could track my work is through thinking about the body vulnerable to the body protected. That's kind of the framework we're going to look at tonight. Um, this work is called Neapolitan, and um, usually the way I get started on a project is I have what I call a brain burr, B-U-R-R, -R, brain burr, and the idea that an idea w or an image will get stuck in my head, and I can't seem to quite get it. You know, it's just kind of there like, eh, 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 eh. And it could be there for years, in fact, sometimes, before I even write anything down or try to do anything about it. And those are the ideas that I end up making into art. Sometimes it could be quite a quick process, and sometimes it could be something that sits in my head a long time. So this video is one of those those types of things. Um, I got the idea when I was watching a movie called Frase Chocolate, and it's a seminal film by Cuban uh, filmmaker Gutierrez. And at the end of the film, I was watching, and you know, I cried. I'm I'm very man easily manipulated by med media and narratives in the media, emotionally, and um, I thought, God, I wonder if I just, you know, could rewound the end of a movie after watching the whole thing if I could sort of create a kind of emotional vibrator that would, um, uh, I don't want to say rid myself of emotions, but maybe would make me less uh, malleable to the narrative. So after thinking about it for a while, I couldn't think of a reason to change the movie, to make it a different movie conceptually. So I just stuck with the movie Fresa y Chocolate, Strawberry and Chocolate, and uh, named the work Neapolitan, like the strawberry chocolate vanilla ice cream, and then became the problem of how to display the work. 
um, after I made the video. And I ended up sort of going with this installation that was a bit like feminist fiber art on steroids or, you know, a kind of granny vibe, but like out of control granny vibe, super cozy. And um, this, this kind of came about because at the time, um, you can see I have a square TV, not a flat, not a flat, mon not a flat TV, but a square monitor. At the time, I was sort of trying to minimize that expression, that the object of a monitor in my home. And so I put like a scarf on it or something and then a plant and a couple pictures. After a while, I started realizing that I was sort of recreating a kind of installation that you might see at one's grandmother's house or mom's house or something. And I started sort of thinking about that kind of at-home installation and um, thinking about this way in which this very emotional work could sit inside of this other kind of um, narrative, this other very cozy narrative. And I think a lot of my work tends to do that, sort of take something that's very familiar and then kind of amp it up. Um, here's the same installation uh, at the Broad in Los Angeles. The other um, installation was um, was at Yerba Buena in San Francisco. So in this installation you could see that when people sit on the bench to watch the video they're, they're tethered in with these headphones that are also crocheted and the wires are crocheted and it goes all the way up to the TV and the person becomes part of the, the, the project. So, um, this is not my work, <laughs> but it's kind of how I think about my work. This is a, a kind of, of um, quilting known as crazy quilt, crazy quilting. And the idea behind crazy quilting is that you've you've kind of done all everything you can with all the squares and triangles and everything, and you have such small pieces left, and you start fitting them together with all these different kind of stitches and designs. And I really love this image. I just it's just something I found online at one point, and and I kept it because I love both the mandala quality of it, the circular quality of it, and the hand stitched quality of it, and. Um, I'm more, I, I, I would hesitate to call myself a fiber artist, but I'm definitely uh, an amateur of many things. And, and one of those things is creating um, what could be called soft sculpture or fiber arts. And, um, you know, I don't really think about my work in such a linear fashion. So when I'm talking about stuff, I'm not, I'm not going to be saying, I did this, and then I thought this, and then I did this, and I thought that. Kind of for me, it's more like I have access to all these different kind of frameworks and materials that I've used in the past and characters and symbolic materials that I can bring back and remix at any point to create different kinds of works. Um, let's see. Oh, this is going wicky wacky. So I put this image in here because uh, being a girl from the Central Valley, this was the first time that I did something that was considered, that could have been considered performance art. And this was my first year I attended Fresno State University initially as undergraduate uh, with a, um, a major in agriculture economics and a minor in pre-law. And I was really bored and the classes were really hard for me. Um, you know, I was kind of like a good student in high school and got a scholarship and everything and then went to university and, ooh, it was hard. And so I started taking dance classes and kind of skipping my statistic classes and being a bad kid and hanging out with like the college DJs and that kind of thing. And I ended up taking a lot of dance classes and I'm doing this like solo in the spring concert <laughs> with my dance with my dance class and uh it was very dark uh very soy darks so very um abstract to the meat puppets who was this like punk rock kind of 
ambient noise band that came through Fresno, where I was living at the time. But I grew up in San Joaquin. And so, you know, I just wanted to bring that up because, you know, in in the Q&A um, or when we're getting a chance to talk, I, I'm from San Joaquin. I just want to put that out there. So, um, you know, cut to, I think this was, uh, oh gosh, maybe 83 or something like this. And then, you know, I, I, I moved, ended up moving to San Francisco and around 1992, I was doing, um, work that would be maybe considered, um, drag or club type performances. Um, at the time, you know, the people that were kind of influencing my work were people, you know, like Karen Finley, Luis Alfaro, uh, Guillermo Gomez Pena, people who were really putting themselves out there in performance. This was 1992. It was the time when people talked about the discovery of the Americas. And this is one of those works that happened very quickly and had a kind of a, mm, uh, a, a lasting impact. I'll say that. Um, I was invited to do a salon at a friend's house, their loft. And, um, I said, okay, I'll bring my strap on burrito. And we just laughed and laughed and I didn't end up doing anything with that. And then we, we, we kind of kept thinking about how funny that was. And so I did a work called Indigerito. This particular image is from doing, I believe, the work at the Women's Building in San Francisco. And um, so I would invite white men to come up to the stage and take a bite of my burrito to absolve themselves from 500 years of the repression of white guilt. And, um, you know, it was a, it was a gag. It was a comedy, um, it kind of lamb, lambasted, uh, you know, ritual performance art and these kind of, uh, sincere conversations. And, um, I was good with that. We, we had a lot of fun doing it. Um, I would never have problems getting people to come out of the audience, uh, to do this uh, ritual performance art with me. Later, I ended up making a kind of really terrifying wax sculpture of this performance and allowing people to get up on a little stage. It was part of a, a show that was at the lab in San Francisco and people could get on this like, you know, very short platform stage and they could kneel and um, have themselves photographed taking a bite of the burrito. About the same time, um, I was working with this character named Rosa, and um, she ended up getting an invitation through another person to go to the Joan Rivers show. Um, the J Joan Rivers was a very well-known uh, female comedian. She's she's not no longer of this earth. But she um, was a well-known uh, woman comedian who then had a talk show. And uh, she was very funny, very funny, very funny woman. And um, she had a show that was um, about exhibitionists. So re remember, it's 1992. And I went on as this character named Rosa who said I was a, a stunt exhibitionist. And I had this persona, it was a persona kind of work. It was an intervention work into the mainstream in which uh, I, I, at the time in the, in the early nineties, I was um, engaged with and supporting a community of um, trans, what we might call uh, trans men or, or female to male community. That, that well, those were my those are just my friends and so I'd go to these meetings and support groups and whatnot and we didn't have that kind, we didn't have that language then we didn't call people trans um, we called people uh, F to M's female to male and so uh, we wanted to kind of 
create a little bit, plant a seed, a uh, proverbial seed into the consciousness, uh, broader consciousness of America. So I went on the Joan Rivers show and I told a story about meeting a fellow um, uh, exhibitionist who was a multi-gendered ambisexual. And Joan had, had not heard about this story because what they have, you know, when you go on TV, there are producers that talk to you quite a long time about your story and they take notes and they give the notes. They, they boil down the conversation and they give the notes to the, the host. So the host can sort of be somewhat informed and, and help move the conversation along. But anyway, I held the story back from the producer because I wanted Joan's kind of uh, response, you know, kind of un unvarnished response. And she, uh, so I said to her, I met a fellow exhibitionist at an aquarium. They were multi-gendered ambisexual, something like that. And she looked at me, she said, an aquarium? Like she was really taken aback uh, to the point where she, you know, she couldn't quite clock what I had said. And then she started getting into it. And she said, um, so, you know, did they have a penis? Like it became this whole conversation about the genitalia of the person. So I, I kept switching genders. I would say he and she and he and she and he and she when I was telling the story. And so at some point, Joan gets a bit flustered and says, well, did she have a penis? And I said, yes. And then we went to commercial break. Um, shortly after that, I started doing a work called America the Beautiful. The work developed really from a single image, a single brain burr that was about taping my body, uh, my flesh, kind of sculpting it. And at first I started just doing that um, when I'd have these performance opportunities. So there was a festival, it's an improv festival. And I ended up bringing people on stage and taping them and placing them on ladders. But then um, later I sort of applied it to my own body. Um, this, is a, this is a work called Given Over to Want. And the, these two works, kind of use some similar materiality in that this work, America the Beautiful, I use a lot of tape, I use a lot of shadow play. This work I use also tape and shadow play, but I end up really just being the shadow and then pulling the sheet down over myself. And I tape a, bag, a, a box of wine to my head and puncture it with a knife. It sort of start following the wine stream around trying to drink the wine. And it's very, very animalistic kind of um, experience to see the word. Very body oriented, very visceral, very smelly. You could smell the wine. You, I get drunk during the work because I really am trying to drink this whole box of wine. One fell swoop. Other, you know, so we could think about these kind of ways in which I'm exposing, exposing my body, um, taping my body, um, uh, uh, kind of pushing the image of the animalistic qualities of the body. And then here's a work called Now's Under the Rug in which I'm laying under a rug <laughs> with a microphone uh, for about 45 minutes at an opening and I'm basically just commenting around what's happening around me um, and um, and sort of disappeared uh, my body from this from the situation. Here's a kind of in what we could call an endurance work. A short endurance, but endurance nonetheless. It's called some gravity. And it's a work where I um, tape a bag of water on my head and I try to relax into it um, to the point where I need to, you know, break the bag of water. And this is a, this is a freshie. <laughs> it's kind of a goof on also a wet t-shirt contest because um, 
clearly uh, my t-shirt's going to get wet. Um, but I, you know, sometimes I do it with several bags, like one after another. You can see someone's in the background just waiting with a mop bucket uh, to clean up. This one is at a, in a, a ch in a Chelsea gallery in New York. I can't really remember the name of the space at the moment. Um, you know, this is a work that is called Deathbed. Uh, death is a little bit in the air for me right now. Yesterday was my father's death anniversary. Tomorrow is Jose Munoz's death anniversary, a very uh, well-known queer scholar and, and and a dear a dear departed friend of mine. <laughs> And um, he would crack up just to hear me talking about him like that. But um, this is a work called Deathbed. And I have this idea that uh, I wanted to create a photo image of a fantasy of how I'd want to be found dead. I know that sounds kind of macabre, but, um, you know, I think a lot of people are pretty obsessed with death or, you know, kind of what what happens to the body at the point of death. And I know I've been very obsessed with death since I was a, since I was a kid. Um, probably some of you have had to experience death when you were younger and you might have fell into like thinking about it, trying to understand frameworks around death. Um, but um, this was a work I actually made for I was on this. I was on this TV show called "Work of Art: America's Next Great Artist," and I had to make a piece of work and videotape myself, um, kind of constructing it uh, as part of getting on the show. So this this was the work that I that I made for that show. But it wasn't a work that I made for the show. It was just another work that was sitting in my head, and so. It was kind of next in line, so I made it. Um, later, I turned the photo. The, when I was making the the photograph, I thought the process of the fo making the photograph was really interesting, because what this was the photograph I ended up choosing, and and um, what I wanted to try to capture theatrically in the photograph was this idea of kind of a last breath. So the idea of a of an exhalation into the cosmos <laughs> in a way of kind of still warm but not there, if that makes sense. So in the process of doing that performance with the photographer, I thought, well that's a kind of an interesting performance. So I ended up restaging it as a performance. I restaged the photo as a performance. So here in the gallery, someone will come into the gallery, they'll see what they believe is a video and they'll go around the video screen and I will be there live. The photograph is cut out just to the point of fitting my face and the photograph is suspended between the video camera and my body. So um, I bring this up because also when I did go on to that show, Work of Art, The Next Great Artist, I, um, I did this work for the show to get on the show. And then the first episode, this guy, Miles, who was on the show with me, he made a portrait of me dead, which was kind of cosmic. Um, there's me in the blue looking very haughty. Uh, this was my catchphrase. I'm not responsible for your experience of my work. Hmm. Uh, this is the work I was kicked off with. Uh, I was really trying to get kicked off that night and it worked. Uh, um, so one of the reasons I'm kind of going through this because this work, um, being on the show, um, led me into a kind of process that I'm more engaged in now, which is more of a research process. So because I was on a kind of mainstream space, I did have a lot of people coming for me, so to speak, 
people who are really liked me, people who really hated me. The mainstream is really is not that fun of a, a place to pop your head up into, it turns out. But anyway, here's one of my favorite letters um, from a 15 year old who's rooting for me. You have such interesting style of art. It was so magnific magnificent style I've never seen before. Um, anyway, Haley was a doll. Then I would also get these uh, kind of memes about me online. <laughs> this was something that I thought was actually somehow flattering because I thought, hey, fire breathing dragon, that's cool. But then when I looked it up, it was um, somebody who's really mad about me a uh, young woman and um you know she wrote a caption and oh there's this great show on tv called work of art but there's this one artist that made me so angry that i stayed up all night making this collage of her and um that was cool to inspire somebody to make art um so that was good but uh, during, while well, the show was airing, I was getting a lot of sort of positive and negative attention. And I was kind of imagining making a piece of art that was a kind of talisman or metaphorical protection. And in my mind, it was this dress, this big dress. I had like a high collar and it came all the way down, covered my arms and went all the way down and was made of Kevlar or something like that. About the same time, I, I, I was invited to be in this group show from Chewbacca to Zapata revisiting the myth of the Mexican Revolution. And um, a lot of times that's how the work gets created for me. It's sort of an opportunity mixed with a kind of moment, something I'm thinking about. And um, I try to see what's, what's there for me. Um, so... I started looking at the Mexican Revolution, and, and very quickly I found these um, images of women who were uh, in uh, brigades that were fighting during the Mexican Revolution, the Zapatistas, uh, or the Panchas, Panchitas, some people called them, like Pancho Vio Panchita and Emiliano Zapata, Zapatistas. And these women were wearing dresses that looked just like this image I had in my head of this dress that I wanted to make. And it was, it was really surprising to me. Like, it's so obvious, but I didn't really put it together until I saw them. And so I thought, well, I'll just make a metaphorical protective space for these women, a kind of metaphorical time travel to protect them so I made an Edwardian style dress out of Kevlar uh, that was the image of it or the the pattern for it was very much taken from these um, archival photos that I that I was um, that I was experiencing as I was researching the Mexican Revolution and um, I ended up testing it against weapons from the era. So uh, guns that were used in the Mexican Revolution, historic guns. And it did end up uh, stopping a nine millimeter slug um, from a historical weapon. It wouldn't, the dress I made wouldn't stand up to contemporary weapons, but it did stand up to historical weapons. And you could see, so I have it displayed here uh, kind of as a fallen soldadera. And you could see a kind of spot in the apron, and that's the nine millimeter slug that it stopped. That's directly where it stopped it. And you can see this fraying around the edges of the apron, and that's uh, it. Out when I shot it, that's just what happened. The Kevlar sort of frayed out like a cartoon. And the way Kevlar works and, and bullet resistant kind of materials like this work is that they don't stop a bullet because they're thick like steel or hard like steel or something like that. They stop a, a, a projectile because the threads are very fine. It's actually, actually invented by a female scientist, Kevlar DuPont. 
and they the, the threads are very fine and they're woven in such a way that they create a tension a back and forth tension so when a projectile hits it it disperses the impact in the fiber it disperses the impact it doesn't stop it through like thickness it stops it by dispersing the impact so um i really love that also metaphorically as an idea for community or people coming together to protect each other and um i became really um invested in researching these different uh, archives of women who fought in the Mexican Revolution. And although it is the most well-documented war, because it was the beginning of the advent of still photography um, and, and movie making, and moving image, um, I did not end up finding a ton of images of women, but I did find some real special ones. These are from the special collections at UC Riverside. And they have um, something in the range of 20,000 images from the Mexican Revolution. I looked through most of them and uh, pulled a lot of them. For a film that I made, um, these, are, this, these are some of my, my, my favorites. La Banderas. These are women who would follow the soldiers during the Mexican Revolution and, and wash their clothes and... Uh, the, you know, they were wives, they were comfort women, they, they bore children during the Mexican Revolution, they were nurses. They also fought. Some of them stayed behind to protect their villages. It was a very, the, the way that the war was fought was um, like small groups uh, that would kind of roam the countryside um, looking for a Mexican army and being in conflict with them. It was a really messy war. It lasted for 10 years. Largely fought for, idealistically at least, uh, for land rights and um, to, to, to bring people out of poverty and bring them into a, a literate space. This is one of my most favorite images from the archive. Just look at that horizon uh, line and that um, the, that point in the distance is just so fascinating to me and the way their eyes are sort of peering out. I just love that photo so much. Um, I ended up making multiple dresses, multiple Kevlar dresses, and making a film based on a film that the famous filmmaker Sergei Eisenstein he left behind a script called Silva Vera that I never made. The larger work was called, well, at least it was renamed Que Viva Mexico. You could find it on YouTube, Meet Que Viva Mexico by Sergei Eisenstein, the well-known Russian filmmaker. And um, he had written a script for a section called Silva Vera, but he was never able to finish it because there was a lot of scandal around his being in Mexico. Um, apparently he'd taken on some homosexual love interests and had ran out of money. Anyway, he had to go back to Russia. And so I took his script and I, um, I, I recreated the film with um, you know different people in my community, friends, artists, um, students from UC Riverside, people who would just walk by my studio, hey, you wanna be in a film, that kind of thing. And um, so I recreated the script and I used images from the archive as my backdrop and shot the film in green screen. Along the way with this journey, I ended up um, finding out about the last survivor of the Mexican Revolution, a really incredible woman by the name of Leandra, uh, Becerra Lumbreras, and she was 127 years old when I met her. And she was the last known survivor of the Mexican Revolution. And apparently, according to her grandchildren who I had met, um, they um, 
they told me that she had 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 given birth to two sons during the Mexican Revolution, and that she had led a group of women as uh, you know these these kind of support brigades. And at the end of the revolution, when they were giving out land, she stood in line with the men. This is the story they told me. And she had her two sons with her that she'd given birth to on the trail and said, I have thought I've given birth to two sons. I want my land. I want my piece of earth. I want my tierra. And they gave it to her. Um, I had a really quite an amazing time filming her. Oops, it looks like, oh, there it is. So I created this kind of sculpture that um, is a kind of knockoff or goof on VR. Uh, it has uh, a video of, of Leandra inside of it in a stereoscopic view, which was a really popular kind of way to view photography that created a 3D effect back in the um, late 1800s. And so basically it's two videos side by side and they're inside of this uh, old fashioned stereoscopic viewer. There's some wooden headphones and then you, um, as you lean forward to look at the video, you also get a, a good whiff of fresh guavas that were inside of Leandra's home. So I'm going to play a little bit of Leandra for you. Hi, hi, to um, put some links in the chat for my new work um, that I'm doing uh, and the uh, upcoming uh, performance. And also, I'm going to put in the chat a video that is <clears throat> part of the new work for you guys to for you guys to check out. So the new work, um, Stacy kind of alluded to it a bit. Uh, is the redesign of the speculum and an, and a look at the at the history of the pelvic examination and the script around that and then um, I'm presenting a, a new VR spectacle at Red Cat in a couple of weeks. So um, uh, those works are pretty new. So I don't I don't want to go down that road too much. 